Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming to listen to me uh, talk about my summer research. Um, I'm Benji. Um, I did this work under the uh, mentorship of Dr. McCullen Sandora with my fellow YSP, Shaham Gupta. Um, and I will be sharing some results. So um, when getting into this project, I think the first thing that I really wanna do is talk about the why, the motivation behind it. And it really boils down to this. Um, and Adriana actually gave me some excellent context here that I can jump off of because the whole life detection bit database is based off of the idea that it's probably going to be a lot of ambiguity as we're searching through the solar system for life. It's not gonna be as simple as taking your magic lifoscope and pointing it at Mars or Europa and getting a definite answer about whether or not there's something there. You're gonna deal with a lot of ambiguous results and a lot of unknowns. And ambiguous results and unknowns um, are sort of vacuums that quickly get occupied by human bias. So my goal, uh, or our goal with this, was to try to see if we could use mathematics and specifically the laws of probability to take it, take the decision making about these things out of the hands of human bias as much as we could. Um, and specifically, let's say you have an ambiguous biosignature detection, how do you determine an optimized way to plan your follow-up mission and your follow-up research? So. Um, the first thing that we thought about when considering this is what makes a result ambiguous in the first place? And it kind of comes down to two things, right? False positives and false negatives. So you could have a situation where you thought you found life, but it was actually some kind of geochemical sleight of hand tricking your instrument. Or you could end up with a situation where you scoop up a soil sample on Mars and you look for microbes and you find none, but your instrument just wasn't sensitive enough and it was actually teeming with microbes. Most likely you're gonna end up with situations where you have potential for both false positives and false negatives. You might have one experiment that gets a positive result and then a different experiment looking at a different chain of evidence that gets a negative result. Um, and in such a situation where you have those conflicting results, how are you going to decide uh, which lead to prioritize in your follow-up work? Um, well, that is what we constructed a tool to be able to decide with. So next thing that we sort of, a um, little building block of our tool here is um, Bayes' theorem. Now Bayes' theorem is really wonderful because it's in a way recursive. So as you successively gain more information about something, in this case, the probability uh, that life is present given uh, a detection by a biosignature emission, um, the more you can update that probability of life given detection to account for your new information. So it seemed like a natural choice. So we have probability of life given detection here. We have the prior probability of life evolving, which we have no idea about. I'll get to how we account for it. Um, the probability of detection given that life is present. And then finally, the probability that your instrument actually detected the biosignature P of D. That can of course be expanded down here. And so the second thing is, um, the second set here is the probability of detection given non-life. So this would kind of be getting at your false positives times the probability of no life evolving. And these of course are variables we've already defined in the first part right here. So um, we do two things uh, in the next stage. First, we're gonna take that equation and we're gonna put it in terms of the probability of false positive and the probability of false negatives, which we can treat as compound probabilities of all of the different hypotheses that could result in false, negative, and positive. And we're gonna do the responsible thing and assume that we have no idea about the prior probability of life evolving because guess what, we don't. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're in this game, right? I mean, um, one of the biggest motivations behind astrobiology is that we don't know P of L. Um, 
So you're going to integrate a uniform probability distribution from probability zero, your lowest probability. There's absolutely no chance of life evolving to probability one. There's a hundred percent chance life absolutely has to be there. And you're going to integrate over everything in between those two. Um, and that, yeah, it's called a uniform distribution. And um, finally, the last little uh, piece in this puzzle is the Shannon information entropy. So um, what information entropy tells you is how random your data is, or in other words, how uncertain your results are, right? And you wanna minimize this. You wanna minimize your entropy, but you only wanna do it in a certain way, right? Because you don't wanna be certain that you're wrong. That would be this axis here, where you have hundred percent certainty of a um, false positive or false negative. You know where I'm, where my cursor is, right? What you want to get is zero, as close to zero as possible, but also as close to zero probability of false positive and zero probability of false negative. That's this bottom left corner here. So, let's say you have your ambiguous results from your biosignature detection, right? You can place those results um, on this gradient based on what values you have for the probabilities of false positives and false negatives. And um, from there, you can decide what's the first thing to prioritize to get you closer to the bottom left corner. So either you're going to want to prioritize uh, an experiment that has no chance of a false negative, so you're going to want to move leftwards towards the bottom, bottom left corner or you're gonna to wanna to prioritize something that has the minimized probability of uh, false positive in, in the case where you're under the uh, diagonal line, in which case you would want to go, the quickest thing you could do to get closer to that zero point would be to go vertically down. And so you can use this as sort of a quick mathematically based way to make your decision about what kind of experiment you want to prioritize when you're doing your follow-up mission. Um, now, I also decided to look into another topic, which is um, solar system techno signatures. Yes, you heard that right. Specifically, the whole topic of lurkers. Now, um, to introduce this idea, I'm going to show you this picture here. This is all of the probes that we have sent on escape trajectories out of our solar system. And you could imagine hypothetically, maybe extraterrestrial civilizations out there have been doing this at a far greater rate. Um, and if so, one such probe may have landed in our solar system at some point. It would be a roughly 10 meter needle in a 1000 astronomical unit haystack. So. How do you decide how to parse through your needle and haystack search? Well, we decided to do a similar thing to what we did with biosignatures. We decided to treat it as a trade-off optimization problem. In this case, the trade-off is between resolution and field of view. Because what you can do is you can either look through more of the haystack, so you can look with an instrument that has more field of view for your lurkers, or you can comb through less haystack with a finer tooth comb for smaller needles, in which case you would prioritize uh, spatial resolution. And so what we essentially did is we created another Bayesian probability um, for the probability of um, detecting a lurker given n greater than zero lurkers present, uh, lurker being meaning you know probe lurking in our solar system, right? Um, and we created another probability gradient here. Um, now this black curve here plots the trade-off between resolution and field of view. And what you, the way that you would find an optimized sort of uh, compromise between the two is you would go where this curve hits um, the maximum probability in the gradient. So in this case, if you look at the color scale, that's the, the dark blue is probability one. So that would place that optimized trade-off point right around the minimum right here, um, the local extrema. And so um, you can find what that 
minimum or what that extreme uh, sort of optimized value is for different patches of space in the solar system that we've looked at in different resolutions. Um, and from there, once again, you have a way of mathematically making a decision um, about, in this case, a techno signature search in a way that puts it entirely in the hands of the equations and takes it out of the hands of your biases. Um, and so very quickly, because I know I'm probably really, really short on time, um, I'm just going to discuss a couple of ways that I'm, we're hoping on expanding uh, on these two avenues. So one thing is we're going to uh, create kind of a compendium of those optimized uh, resolution uh, field of view trade-offs for different spots in the solar system um, so that we can create almost a sort of roadmap for future lurker searches using this tool. Um, the other way that we want to apply this to a real world situation is there was a paper that did Bayesian analysis of a finding of methane in plumes coming from Europa. Um, not Europa, Enceladus, my bad. Um, the one in the one, you know, behind my head. Um, and um, the cool thing about that paper is they did some pretty sophisticated modeling where they got down to some pretty good numbers about um, your pro about different probabilities that it was that there were false positives or false negatives present in the data. And so one thing we're also going to try to do is apply their model, apply our model to their models and see if we can come up with a recommendation for future exploration of Enceladus. And so that uh, is all folks I have for today. Feel free to ask questions. Lovely, thank you very much, Benji, it was fantastic. Um, oh, Graham, are you back on audio? I think so, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, have no, no, I just I, muted I have myself. Now I can record anything. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a great talk, Benji. Um, so are there any questions? You can ask them in the chat or you can raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah, I saw, have no, one question. Um, okay, Sanjoy has a question. Uh, Adriana, I think, had a question and Andrew had a question. Uh, we have time for one of those. Oh. Okay, who really, who's, who really wants to ask, I guess? <laughs> I don't know. Um, just unmute yourself and ask if you want to. Go for it, Adriana. I was just clapping. <laughs> that was just a clapping. Oh, thank reaction. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, anyone else have a question they want to ask? I can, but I would rather have somebody else ask a question. But OK, so I'll ask my question. Um, I really appreciate the effort of moving uh, from PL to PSN and PFP, but don't you need the priors of PSN and PFP in order to calculate them in the first place? And so how does that advance you? I guess? Right, so it is that is a tricky thing. Um, the way that you can kind of, the way that I thought about it was, um, you know, that there, you still have certain probabilities of different mechanisms that could cause a false positive and false negative. So you could say that there's a probability that there would be enough, um, I don't know, perchlorates present in the Martian soil to trick up the uh, labeled release experiment on Viking or something, um, just as an example. Um, now you're still gonna have to deal with that those probabilities might be tricky to find, um, but, um, it at least makes it so that you can sort of see what recommendations you get from different models, I guess. Um, and you're still, you're still, you know, it doesn't, it's not perfect. It doesn't completely get rid of your ambiguity. Um, but it takes it one step further out of it, I guess. The next step further out of it is for someone else to figure out or for me to figure out if uh, we keep going at this. Thank you. All Very right. Cool. You don't know what the future holds. Um, but I am curious if you, if you do continue that work on the Enceladus paper, um, there was a good bit of backlash to their interpretation. So I, I'd love to see 
what your what your model would do with their interpretations. Yeah, uh, yeah, 